copyrighted program created by the Rio Grande Oil Company. Gasoline powers more police and emergency cars than any other brand, everywhere it is sold. Every second is precious in answering emergency calls, and the leading cities and counties of the West have satisfied themselves by practical tests that the fastest, most powerful gasoline they can buy is Rio Grande Crack. The purpose of tonight's program is not only to entertain you, but also to induce you to use the same gasoline that is specified for the fastest, most powerful cars on the highway. If Rio Grande Crack gives better performance in these cars, obviously it will improve the performance of your car. You travel the same highways. You, too, need emergency performance from your gasoline many times every day. We not only promise you greater speed and power with Rio Grande Crack gasoline, but that this gasoline will carry you more miles for less money. Official city records prove this to be true. And if you'll drive into your nearest Rio Grande station, we'll prove to you that it costs no more to enjoy police car performance. Christmas shopping rush of several years ago. Mr. 
Mr. and Mrs. Abraham's ministry are paying one of their many visits to a little radio shop near their home on 29th Street. Papa, I think this would make us an elegant piece of furniture. No, well, I'm telling you it's too big. It costs too much. I'll tell you what I'll do. Uh, I'll buy you this one. It's a little smaller, but you can play it louder. No, no, Papa. This big one would be lovely by the green touch over stuff. Mama, you approach me yet? I, I tell you it's too much. Gee, pipes are rocks in the day. You keep your hand on your business and your customers. Yeah, but I'm blinded by the ice. I pipe the headlight on the old man's finger. Boy, it's worth a fortune. All right, but you're selling radios. Yeah. Uh, I think Madam will find the Empire console model here will fit in most agreeably with her other furnishings. Papa, did you hear what he told me? Madam. He's paying you compliments and it's costing me money. Hello, Mrs. Minsky. How are you? Hello, Mrs. Mansovich. How are you? What a beautiful fur coat. Mrs. Minsky, you have been spending on your Rebecca once more, no? Mm, Mrs. Mansovich, so this is costing me money. Oh, Mrs. Mansovich. Let me tell you, Papa put out fifteen hundred dollars for this seal skin coat. Fifteen hundred dollars? No. Is it possible? You are a good husband, Mrs. Amenta. I'll tell you what I do, Mama. I make you a proposition. We go home now and we buy the radio maybe sometime again later. Uh, perhaps Madam would like to hear the tone of the instrument. No. No, I know it must be very classy. You know me, you know, because it's Papa is so good to me. He buys me everything I want. You're fortunate, Rebecca. My man is not so. He's a loafer. Fourteen years he has had his meat market. And what has he got for me? Nothing but seven kids on a mortgage. <laughs> I should better be married to your husband. Mm. No, Mrs. Nonsovich. That you cannot do. Papa is mine. Papa is so good to me. You mean... You can lock up the radio and send it up to our house. You have the address? Yes, ma'am. Did you get that? This is mine, so it's mine. On the next day, Roy Behold, the clerk in the radio store, installs the new radio for Mr. and Mrs. The Minster. Uh, just one more wire to fasten and you'll be all set, madam. How nice. Uh, that all looks nice to me. Papa, how you talk. You don't appreciate artistic things. Too long you've worked without getting culture. Now we can enjoy things. There you are, madam. The tubes are warming up now. Oh, Papa, listen. Music. I hear it. Oh, in Poland it was not so. When you did that. No, but you could hear all the designers play for nothing. There you are, madam. This dial on the right controls the volume. What's that? I make it louder or softer. Now, this dial here brings in your station. If it gives you any trouble, let me know. Don't worry. We will. Uh, nice place you got here, madam. Very tastefully furnished. Do you think so? Maybe you'd like to look around. I just ate some cookies. Would you like some in a drop of wine, maybe? Uh, sure. Uh, don't mind if I do. Walter, you never saw such a rock in your life. Biggest spotlight. Yeah? Beyond the level. Must be ten grand in ice in the place. Tough to knock over? Nah, it's a pipe. I've been back there four times to service the radio. I jimmed it when I put it in so it wouldn't work any too hot. I got the whole layout. Okay. As an old con yourself, you ought to know a good thing when you see it. But this ain't my record. Yeah, I know. It's different from safe cracking. It's a crying scene to overlook an easy knockover like this. Yeah, you're right. Well, when do you want to go? Anytime you say. Oh, there's no time like now. Okay, pal. <laughs> January 23rd, 1929, a Chevrolet Coupe cruises back and forth on West 29th Street. Finally, it comes to a stop, and the driver quickly turns off the light. It's dark enough now. Let's get going. Okay, just a minute. What's the delay? Oh, uh, I've got to get a shot. Hey, what's the big 
big idea. No. Didn't you know I was drunk on this stuff? No. Well, I am. Well, you better lay off sniffing cocaine. We got work to do. Oh, I couldn't do a thing unless I got a load. Uh, that's better. Here. Yeah. You want to try it? No, no thanks. Uh, you ready now? Yeah. That's so. all. Don't forget now, I'm Gabe, and you're John. Okay. Here's the house. And the dog? No. Good. All right, uh, let's keep these bandanas on. You got yours? Yep. Well, how do I look? Like Jesse James? <laughs> yeah, something like that. And here's old Black Bart right behind you. Got your get out? Sure. All right, let's get going, then. Wait a minute. The screen door's locked. You ring that bell like the devil while I cut off the screen. Okay. There we are. Oh! Hey, what's the matter? Oh, I cut myself on the screen. But I got it unlocked. Pipe down. Here comes the old guy. Good evening. What can I do for you? Put him up and keep him up and shut your eyes. What is this? A practical joke? No, it ain't no joke, and I'll get inside. Easy, Papa. This stand there in the draft afternoon. They're already coming in, Mama. Shut that door, Gabe. <laughs> Quiet, you. Put up your hand, too. Oh, don't frighten her, please. Put the guns down. You won't try to run away. Shut up, you. There, put your hands up. Well, what do you want of us? We came for diamonds. Hand them over and be quick about it. What diamonds? We have nothing you would want. Is that so? Suppose you let us be the judge of that. Where are they? I tell you, I... Shut up. We'll find them ourselves. Face the wall, you two. You can cover Gabe while I fix the joint. Okay. Uh, nothing here. Please, mister. That's my wedding limit. in silent. Don't care Oh, shut up. How you doing, John? Uh, I guess we'll have to torture it out of them. We can't stay here all night. Wait a minute. Here's a jewel box. Ah, uh, nothing. Nothing but a piece of string of pearls. These are these real? They are. Okay. Well, let's see what's in here. Ah. So this is the fifteen hundred dollar seal skin coat. Why? How did you know how much it cost? Well, you'll be surprised, lady. But don't worry. You can keep it. We ain't got no use for it. Thank you. Now, won't you take the string of pearls and go? Sure. As soon as you tell us where the diamonds are. Yeah, but I can't. We haven't any diamonds. There must be some mistake. Oh, come on and quit wasting our time. We didn't do any guessing when we muscled in here. We know exactly what you got. We come to get it all. But I told you that... Where's that, that big rock you usually flash? I don't know what you're talking about. You don't, eh? Well, you'll soon find out. Gabe, take a sheet off that bed in there and tear it up. We'll see how a little torture works. Now, you two, move back into the bedroom. Come on, get going. Now, sit down on the bed. Come on. You don't want your head blown off, do you? Hey, you. Uh, come on, sit up. What's the matter with you? I have a pain. Well, don't throw any fits. You ain't been hurt yet. Tie the hands behind him, Gabe. Atta boy. Now, hobble their feet. Stop. Stop, I tell you where the diamonds are. Oh, well, you're talking sense, lady. Oh, they're not in here. Untie me and I'll show you where they are. They're in the front room. Carry her in there, Gabe. She don't wear much. Okay, come on, lady. Here. They're in the buffet. I'll get them. But here, I'll keep them in my purse. Take them in your sleep, don't. Please leave us in peace. Hmm, not bad. What did you give for this dinner ring with the three rocks? $2,000. And the marquee cost $500. They're first rate stone, not a flower in them. Now are you satisfied? Not quite. I'll take a look at that first myself. Uh huh. I thought so. Holding out on me. Uh, I wanted to keep those things. Those earrings belong to my grandmother in old country. Please let me keep them. They're worth as much as the ring. I saw this bracelet's an heirloom, too. And it's by a pin. But I know a dame that'll be tickled pink around. Please. Please don't take them from me. Oh, shut up. Come on, we're going back in the other room now. 
Not bad, John. Pretty fair haul. I'll just step into the kitchen and make sure she didn't overlook nothing. Well, make it snappy. I'm going to give this bird just two minutes to tell me where that big rock of his is. And if he doesn't come through, I'm going to cut it out of him. Can't you see my husband here? He was killed. Well, if it does, it's his own fault. I came after that ring and I'm going to get it. What are you going to do with that knife? Now, just you wait and see. Now, my friend, where's that ring? I haven't any ring. Well, I know better. I'm telling you the truth. See this knife? Give me your feet. Come on, don't pull away, or I'll pull out your one. Now I'm going to cut a chunk of the time out of your feet until you get ready to talk. How's that strike you? Please, Mister. Please, John, John. Papa, please, Papa, tell them where it is. Oh, ah, that was just a scratch. Now, here's the second cut. Stop, stop. I'll tell you. I thought so. All right, then. Where is it? Under, under the bed. I threw it under there when I sat down. I thought you were shaking when you said you were sick. Well, you'll find out whether you're telling the truth soon enough. <laughs> yeah, here it is, Gabe. Yeah? I ain't got the big rock, all right. It's worth three grand if it's worth a penny. You find anything else? No. Well, how about it, folks? Got anything else? Studs? Six pins? Anything? No. Honest, you've got it all. He did have a diamond stick pin, but somebody stole it from him on the Jefferson Avenue streetcar. Okay, we got enough now. We'll leave you people tied up. We'll phone the cops after we've left and tell them you've been stuck up. Then they'll come in and tie you. So long. Zeminski doesn't wait for the robber's magnanimous offer to call the police, but as soon as the criminals leave, she unleashes the bonds of herself and her husband and telephones the police department. KGPO, the police radio station, broadcasts the call to the car in the neighborhood of 29th Street, and two minutes later, officers Bird and Ashley, the university division, arrives at Zeminski home. The frightened couple tell their story to the police. And then, as I one of the men were torturing Papa, the other went into the kitchen. What for? I don't know. You better take a look out there, Bert. Okay. Now, would you recognize this man as you saw him again? Uh, I wouldn't know them to see them. The chief says that they had bandanas on their faces. But I don't, but I, oh, I know them if I hear their voices. One of them sounded familiar, didn't you think so, Papa? I couldn't tell. I was too scared. Hey, here's something. What's that? Here's two rings I found in the kitchen with a piece of paper over them. Oh, my dinner ring. Oh, my lovely dinner ring. If the guy was in such a hurry looking the stones over, he forgot these. Yes, Papa. I got my dinner ring back. Is that so, oh, Papa? Yes. Aren't you glad? Oh, uh, Mama. But what about my big solitaire? We'll never see that again. Well, we'll do our best to recover it, Mr. Zeminski. But you can see we haven't got much to go on in the way of identification. Oh, Papa. Maybe it's them again coming back after the ring. I'll answer it. Get the gun out first. Right. What do you want? Is this the Zeminski home? Oh, hello, Pat. What is it? Oh, did you get held up or something? Yes, Pat, but I'll tell you about it some other time, though. I, I'm busy now with these officers. I'll tell you about it tomorrow. Well, all right, only... I wanted to tell you I happened to see a couple of fellas driving up and down the block about a half an hour ago. What kind of a car? Um, Chevrolet, I think. A, a coupe. How come you paid any attention to it? Well, they drove by a couple of times and they sort of looked suspicious, so I thought I'd keep my eye on them. You know, I'm taking a correspondence school course on how to be a detective. You are, eh? Well, maybe you can help us with that. Go on. Well... When I went home for supper, I, I kept thinking about that car, and it, it sort of worried me, so I went out again, and sure enough, that car was parked a little ways down the street from Mr. Zeminski's house. Yeah? So what did you do? Well, I, I stood behind a tree across the street from the house, uh, and I saw the two men get out of the car and walk up on Mr. Zeminski's porch. And so before I went back home to finish supper, I sneaked up behind the car, and I took the license number. What? You got the license number of the car? Sure. Yeah, you know, we've got to do things like that now. Detective lessons, get information and so on. You know, without being... Yeah, yeah, I know, but what's the license number? Oh, hang on. Here it is. I've got it written down here. It's uh, a 1929 license, 7G6783. 7G6783. Get on the phone, Bert, and give the captain that number. He'll place it in a jiffy. Okay. 
kid. You've got the makings of a copper. That's mighty fine police work, getting that number. The Department of Motor Vehicles reports that license 7G6783 is registered to one Walter Daly, who lives at the Renard Hotel, San Francisco. Captain Cahill of the Robert J. Hale at Central Headquarters requests the Chief of Police of San Francisco to investigate this man. The next morning, Captain Cahill receives a reply. Good. Kimberly. Sorry. All right. Yeah. Come into the office about it, will you? Right away, Bill. Well, I got a hot tip on that diamond job. Yeah? What is it? It's a wire from San Francisco. Those boys work fast up there. It says... Walter Daly checked out Renard Hotel January 21st. Gave forwarding address Delroy Hotel, Los Angeles. Reputation unknown. Yeah, you know the Delroy Bill. No, I can't place it. Sure, it's a dump on the other side of the track. Full of dips and snowbirds. Remember we knocked over Jerry Parker down? Oh, there. yeah. Yeah, and we pinched a lot of other mugs in that joint. Well, let's get going. We'll ease down there and have a talk with this Daly guy. <laughs> various lookouts in the police car, which they have parked half a block away, Cahill and Kimberly enter the hotel. Anything I can do for you, Jen? We're looking for Daly. Is he registered here? I don't know. I'll have to telephone, Doc. Have we got anybody here by the name of Daly? Yeah, he's in 642. Some men are in the lobby for you, Mr. Daly. Hey, disconnect that thing. Yo! Yeah, pretty well trained, ain't you? Tipping off the guest. Well, if that's the sort of a joint this is, you're escorting us up to Daly's room personally, mister. Come on, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, you'll find out quick enough. Six floor. Dog. What's the big idea of all this strung on us? All right, we don't have to draw pictures, do we? You're wise to who we are. And if I remember right, I'm wise to who you are. Seems like I've seen you in several show -ups. Oh, yeah? How's about it, Dell? Don't you look familiar? Yeah, he does with that. They are, gentlemen, too slow. Now, where's 642? Right down the hall. Yeah, and the boys are walking out the back way already. Hey, you guys. We're police officers. Stay up and get back in that room. Go on. Make it terrific. You too. Ah, oh, but I'm the manager of this hotel. I don't know. care who you are. You're going in there with the other two. All right, Kimberly. Take him down. Yeah. Find anything? No, no, Dad. Okay. You can put your hands down now. But the first man that makes a move is going to get killed. Now, which one of you is Daly? I'm Daly. All right. That's your suitcase? Yeah. See what he's got in there, Kimberly. No, nothing bad. Oh, uh, here's a camera, Captain. Let me see it. Hmm. What have you been doing with this milk of magnesia daily? Been having stomach trouble? Well, yeah, a little. I've been bothered some lately. Well, that's fine, Daly. Thanks for your information. I happen to know that this stuff you admit is your milk of magnesia is morphine. You know how they'll book you for position of narcotics? You flat put it. Now, don't get tough, Haley. That won't do any good. You better just take it easy. Uh, tell us, Haley, who was your partner on that last job? What job? The one you pulled last night. We didn't pull any job. We sort of think you did. You see, Haley, you can usually spot us guys who wear badges, but you never can tell when an amateur detective is sticking out on you. Hey, Hill takes his business to headquarters, leaving Sperry on stakeout at the hotel. The two men are watched closely on the way to the station to prevent them from throwing away any jewels. For an intensive search of the room had failed to reveal the missing diamonds. They are mugged and fingerprinted. And a comparison of records shows that Daly, under many illnesses, had led a life of crime for 30 years, while DeHogue, his partner, is on parole from Folsom, where he was sentenced to serve a term for bank robbery. Mr. and Mrs. Aminsky are summoned to Central in an effort further to identify the two criminals. 
If you'll just be seated here, Mrs. Zeminski. Oh, thank you. And uh, you over here, Mr. Zeminski. Mm -hmm. uh, Kimberly, bring in number one. Do you folks recognize this man? Papa, that's the nice young gentleman who called me madam. The one who sold us the radio. Yes, I am. I told you you shouldn't have bought that radio, Mama. Hey, what's this all about? I never saw these people before in my life. That's him. That's him. I know him to for sure by his voice. What did you do with my diamonds, you young loafer? Hey, uh, what is this, a frame-up? I don't know nothing about no diamonds. <laughs> Your daily talk, they recognize him as the other robber. That evening, the questioning of daily begins. Now, listen. Before you start asking any fool questions, I got a proposition to make to you. Yeah? Well, here it is. Behold, it's a young fella. He's got a chance. Me, I'm old. I can't do more than one hitch anyway. I'll die up there. Now, if you file a position of narcotics on me and let the whole go back to spirit for violation of parole, I'll tell you where the big diamond is. I I can't get the rest of this stuff back to you. We can't make any bargains with you. We want to know what you did with the jewels. Okay, and I won't tell you. Yeah. I think about as much of you mugs as a man in my racket can think of a bow. And you've got a fair idea how much that is. Look here. I'm on the junk. I need a shot, and I need it bad. But I won't spare anything for nothing. That's okay with us, Daly. It doesn't make any difference if you sell anything or not. You bought yourself a one-way ticket to Folsom, and I found that can of milk of magnesia in your grip. Now, what we want to know is where are the time. Hour after hour, the drilling continues. At midnight, no further progress has been made. Listen, you guys i got to have a shot in the arm. I'll tell you where it is. Only give me a shot. Nothing doing, Daly. You come clean right now. Okay, okay. I'll tell you. I threw away the small stones on the way to the station. And a big one I gave to a pal of mine to keep for me. Now do I get a shot? You're lying, Daly. That isn't what you did with the stones. Listen, I tell you. I'll break if you send me up for narcotics. I'll only give the whole violation of parole. He's a good guy. I'd hate to see him spend his best days up there. Oh, listen. I'll tell you if you'll give me a shot. All the time he's bad. Not a chance. I don't see what you're wasting our time for. We know you did the job. You're going to the big house for it. You can't make a deal with us. You can't duck any... You can't get any dope. But you're going to tell us where that big diamond is if we sit here for six months. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'll tell you. I guess it won't do any good anyway. Well, well, while I was driving down here to the station, I swallowed the darn thing. Rush to the receiving hospital with stomach pumps is applied to the recalcitrant daily, and the diamond is finally recovered. The next day, Mr. Zeminski calls at Captain Cagle's office for his diamond. You sent for me, Captain? Uh, yes, Mr. Zeminski. Come in. Thank you. Well, yes, sir. Well, here it is. What? My diamond. Oh, Captain Dale, how can I thank you? Oh, my beautiful diamond. Oh, that's all right, Mr. Zeminski. It's all the day's work, you know. Oh, you couldn't appreciate, Captain, how much this means to me. But this diamond represents my life, Captain. For years, I saved all the money I could. Even went without food sometimes until I could own this stone. But, uh, Captain, where is the second? Uh, sorry, Mr. Zeminski. We were unable to reclaim it. Well, uh, I can get another setting somehow, but never could I get another dime. <laughs> In the return of his property, Mr. Zeminski rewards alert young Pat for his amateur detective work and is delighted to learn that his would be torturers are made to pay for their crime. William Daly is given five years to life on two counts of first degree robbery and one count of first degree burglary. 
And Roy DeHogue is sentenced to Folsom for violation of parole, two counts of first-degree robbery and one count of first-degree burglary, drawing 16 years to life. In behalf of the cast of Calling All Cars, I make a special request of all our listeners tonight. We have put in long hours in the writing and rehearsing of this show. We have no means of knowing whether or not you like these broadcasts unless you respond by calling personally at the Rio Grande station in your neighborhood. Won't you drop in there tonight or tomorrow? Ask for a copy of the Calling All Cars News. It's free and full of interesting information about these broadcasts. Take the boys and girls of your family into the Rio Grande station with you so they can talk with the Rio Grande dealer and learn how easily they can get a complete junior detective outfit free. Of course, we hope you will try some Rio Grande cracked gasoline, the same gasoline that is used by many police departments featured on these broadcasts. We are all convinced that there is no finer gasoline made. And so many of the West's largest cities and counties specify Rio Grande Crack that there must be a real reason for the popularity of this gasoline. You'll discover the reason when you try a tank full. And we also ask you to let the Rio Grande dealer drain your crankcase next time and refill it with Sinclair motor oil. We feel that Sinclair motor oil gives you greater value, and we'd like a chance to prove it. Thank you.